Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you very much for joining this uh, Coulter Biomedical Engineering webinar series. Uh, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Maizam Guanlu uh, to give us a seminar on the bioelectronics. And uh, just a background, the Coulter seminar series uh, is uh, created to help biomedical students make them aware of the latest breakthroughs in uh, biomedical engineering. And as a part of it, uh, the topic today is on wireless power transfer for implantable medical devices. And uh, very fortunate to have an expert like Dr. Guanlu agree to give a seminar today. And Dr. Guanlu is uh, uh, a senior design engineer with Silicon Creations, uh, where he generates uh, intellectual property with respect to this uh, electronic integration for medical devices, particularly. He is very well renowned. He got his PhD from University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Yeah. 2004, and right after that, he was an assistant professor with uh, the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at North Carolina State University. And then he was a professor with the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Georgia Tech from 2007 to 2019, where he developed a lot of pioneering technologies in wireless power transfer. And uh, he even actually wrote a book on that and very archival journal papers of uh, Key significance, we use that in our course, in our teaching the biomedical device design course in FIU. So the students will easily recognize his name from the slides that we use in the course. And uh, he's also very renowned for his products uh, that he is almost commercializing and some of them are ready for commercialization. One is what he may allude to, the tongue-driven wheelchair assist system for which he got a lot of media coverage to CNN. So, and he's also renowned for this free floating neural recording nodes implanted in the brain. So I think uh, he has two major uh, product uh, level innovations. And uh, as you can see, he has 250 publications and 11 patents. Uh, and he's a fellow of IEEE, recipient of the NSF Career Award, Chomi Nobis Barrier Breaker Award, Distinguished uh, Ang Scholar Award from the Association of Professors and scholars of Iranian heritage. And uh, some of you may be knowing because he organized uh, the BioCast conference in Atlanta in 2015 at the general chair. So we are very happy to have him here and we hand over the, the podium to Dr. Guanlu. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Raj, for the nice uh, introduction uh, and uh, for uh, invitation. I also appreciate FIU uh, for arranging uh, the conference and uh, as well as uh, support uh, from uh, Coulter uh, Foundation. Um, so let's uh, get to the uh, contents of the uh, presentation because that's, uh, I'm sure, uh, why everybody is here. Uh, <clears throat> so let me uh, put my slides in the presentation mode. Uh, can you see the first slide, uh, Raj? Yes. Excellent. Uh, yes. So, uh, today, um, I will uh, talk about uh, some of the fundamentals of uh, wireless power transmission to implantable uh, microelectronic devices. And uh, I will uh, basically start from, uh, as the title suggests, uh, from, from the fundamentals. And throughout uh, this uh, presentation, uh, I will uh, cover um, and uh, give examples from our uh, own uh, prior uh, research. Uh, however, um, uh, these I want to emphasize that the concepts and the, the theoretical background behind uh, what I'm presenting today is really applicable to a wide variety of uh, applications where near field wireless power transfer uh, is being used. And uh, really there, is an, there, there has been an explosion of these um, uh, different applications as I will uh, show you uh, shortly. Uh, so this is the, um, uh, the list of topics that I will uh, cover today. Uh, hopefully I will get through uh, all of them. Um, 
as I said, first I start with some fundamentals that are uh, widely applicable to near field wireless power transfer. Then I will uh, walk you through the steps how to uh, design uh, such a wireless link. So basically for any of these applications, but most uh, specifically for an implantable uh, device, uh, how would you go after designing uh, such a wireless link and how to optimize and maximize the power that you deliver uh, to these uh, implanted uh, devices. And then I will narrow my discussion down to a particular category of these implantable devices, uh, the ones that tend to be very small. And then we say small, uh, we are talking about something below one centimeter, basically in the millimeter range size. Uh, and how do we uh, power uh, such a small tiny device inside the body because as you can imagine uh, if you want to implant something inside the body you want it to be very very physically very very small in order to cause minimal damage to the surrounding uh, tissue so uh, being able to deliver sufficient power to a tiny device inside the body at a certain depth uh, is very important and still a topic of uh, hot uh, risk, uh, ongoing uh, research. And uh, I will uh, again talk about some of the innovations that uh, we did uh, uh, in the past. Um, so the applications are really, really uh, broad, uh, anywhere from uh, electric vehicles that are now becoming very popular thanks to Elon Musk and uh, his uh, companies. Uh, you basically deliver uh, what there are uh, commercial products and uh, some versions of these electric makers that are wirelessly can be wirelessly powered and there you deliver power in kilowatt range uh, all the way and there are basically the the mobile phone uh, in in your pocket uh, could be a version that uh, is wirelessly rechargeable all the way down to the uh, radio frequency identification that uh, has been around for several decades. They are nothing new. And the power delivery to RFID devices, some of them need something in the order of nanowatts, uh, extremely uh, low power. And uh, because the purpose is just to uh, send a code and identify that particular object or they are injected in animals and so on and so forth. So you can see there are several orders of magnitudes from nanowatt range to kilowatt range that you can use in a wireless power transfer in order to um, deliver power and therefore uh, not uh, basically uh, use rechargeable batteries or no battery at all. Like RFIDs have no batteries, but your uh, smartphone and uh, your uh, uh, like the electric vehicle do have onboard uh, batteries and the wireless link is only temporarily being used uh, just to uh, deliver power and uh, recharge uh, the batteries. So really the applications are very, very broad. So among all of these uh, different applications, our focus is going to be on implantable devices uh, because we are uh, at the Department of uh, Biomedical uh, engineering and uh, many of you are maybe more interested in uh, this type of uh, wireless power transfer. And speaking of implantable medical devices, actually they are broader than uh, the ones that are that require uh, power delivery uh, through a wireless link. Some of them actually have uh, uh, primary batteries, basically non-rechargeable batteries, and those are such as the ones uh, shown on the upper right side of the screen. Uh, the, the best example of those are pacemakers. Uh, the first electronic implantable device, um, uh, I, I think it was invented in, in 50s, so they are around for like 70 years now, uh, perhaps uh, millions of people across the world uh, are uh, using them and uh, they have uh, saved many, many uh, lives. Uh, and these uh, devices tend to have a small number of uh, stimulating sites, uh, just uh, two or three or four. Um, and uh, they are autonomous, basically they, they operate by themselves. They don't need a, a lot of communication uh, with uh, inside and outside of the body. And the rate of stimulation for these devices is quite low. For example, a pacemaker operates at a rate of 
want to change their, uh, and that's basically the uh, normal uh, heart rate. Uh, and as a result, the power consumption of these kind of implants is in the, like on average, on, if you average it out, uh, it's in microwatt range. So when the power consumption is in microwatt range, <clears throat> the primary battery, which is not even rechargeable, can last between five to 10 years and there is no need to uh, recharge these batteries. Just every 10 years, uh, the user, the patient will have um, a, a small surgery and uh, the, 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 the pacemaker basically is replaced with a new one and that goes on for another 10 years. So I contrast that with a whole different category of implantable devices, some of them I have uh, shown here. Uh, cochlear implant is the most uh, popular one. Again, it has been around for about 50 years. It, it got FDA approval uh, in 70s, and hundreds of thousands of people uh, in the world, they are using uh, cochlear implants, and several companies are uh, manufacturing them. Uh, so they basically, uh, I, I, or uh, another example is a retinal implant for people who are completely blind, and now there are uh, FDA approved uh, retinal implants, such as the one I'm showing here from Second Sight uh, uh, Company in, in, in California. And there are basically a lot of uh, ongoing research on these brain computer interfaces, including another company by uh, Elon Musk, I'm sure you have heard about it, uh, Neuralink, that uh, uh, again has an inductive <coughs> link and can be wirelessly uh, powered in order to recharge the onboard uh, battery. So that one is not for a stimulation, currently is for recording, but the ones that are for a stimulation, uh, such as cochlear implant and retinal implant, you can see that they have tens of sites as opposed to uh, the pacemaker, and the rate of a stimulation in these uh, uh, devices is much, much uh, higher. For example, cochlear implants, the rate of stimulation uh, in total among all these sites could be tens of, uh, uh, tens of thousands uh, per, uh, per one second. Uh, so for in uh, retinal uh, implants, basically there is a refresh rate of uh, about uh, 30 hertz uh, among uh, 64 or 128 sites. As a result, you cannot uh, basically power, their power consumption is in milliwatt or tens of milliwatt range. So uh, you have one, tens of microwatt to tens of milliwatt, several orders of magnitude higher power consumption. And another uh, difference between these devices and pacemaker is that a pacemaker is placed in the chest area where you have a lot of space. Some of these implantable devices or at least in the abdominal area, you can have basically several centimeters, like this, the size of a matchbox easily fits in those areas. Now, the cochlear implant is placed in the mastoid bone uh, above, above the ear, and the retinal implant, uh, there are different versions of it, the ones that I'm showing here, is actually around, uh, uh, wraps around the eyeball. Uh, so you can see that the space is much, much smaller. There is no room to even have a rechargeable battery for many of these uh, devices. And uh, as a result, a uh, wireless power transmission is the only way to deliver these tens of milliwatts uh, to these uh, devices. Uh, so as a result, you can see a wide range of uh, uh, implantable devices, the ones that uh, have no need for wireless uh, power transfer, they have primary batteries, to the ones that should be continuously powered because there is no room for even rechargeable battery to the ones like uh, the, the implant by Neuralink that has a rechargeable battery. So you deliver power to recharge the battery and then it operates on its own for probably several hours, uh, maybe a day, and then you have to uh, recharge it uh, again. Uh, so this is gonna be the focus of the rest of this uh, presentation. Uh, also, as part of this introduction, I should say that uh, wireless power transfer can be divided to near-field wireless power transfer and far-field wireless power transfer. And in RF engineering, basically near-field and far-field uh, depends on the wavelengths of the electromagnetic wave that 
you use. So uh, the, a big difference between near field and far field is that in near field uh, electromagnetic interaction, the uh, intensity of the, the, the field, the strength of the magnetic field actually drops by one over R cubed. So that is a very rapid rate of uh, 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 basically um, drop. And as a result, your magnetic field is constrained almost within the antenna, between that coil. So between the transmitter and receiver coil, a few centimeters away, the field could be even hard to detect. Now, compare that with far field, where the rate of decline in the strength of the electromagnetic field is one over R. So it can basically extend much, much further. And that is the mechanism used in uh, wireless communication because uh, you can send the signal, the RF uh, signal, much, much further. So that is a major difference. And it all depends on the geometry and the size of the antenna and the frequency of the, uh, basically the signal that, that they use, the carrier that you use to deliver uh, data or uh, power. If you look at the near field itself, uh, we can divide it to reactive and radiative. And once again, that totally depends on the frequency of operation. So I want to uh, emphasize that the rest of this presentation, because we are talking about the near field power transfer between two inductors, is focusing on reactive uh, uh, type of uh, uh, induction. Uh, and the advantage of uh, reactive uh, wireless power transfer is that the energy is stored in a closed space around these two antennas, transmitter and uh, receiver. And the power that is not uh, basically collected by the receiver returns back to the transmitter and therefore can be uh, recovered. And that is very important for implantable devices because uh, it means that the efficiency could be much better and the, 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 the energy that is not being uh, dissipated in the tissue returns back to the transmitter and uh, you are not generating heat. So far field, uh, power transfer is not used uh, for um, powering implantable uh, devices that tend to be used for wireless communication, but near field reactive uh, wireless power transfer is the uh, basically physical phenomenon behind uh, wireless power transfer to implantable devices that are covered. So um, fundamentally from the system level point of view, you have the energy source, basically the, the, the battery, uh, sometimes a replaceable battery. For example, uh, these cochlear implants have this behind the ear uh, processor uh, that uh, you can either recharge or replace the batteries, uh, almost uh, similar to a hearing aid. So the energy source is outside of the body. And then your electronics, the target where you want to power is inside the body. And you want to deliver power from the energy source to your electronics, but along the way, there are several mechanisms of loss. So you have loss in the, first of all, the, the energy stored in the battery is DC. And DC, as everybody knows, uh, DC energy or DC power does not pass through an inductive link. So the first step is to convert that DC energy to AC, so usually uh, you use uh, a class E or class D uh, uh, amplifier in order to do this uh, conversion. So you have some loss there. Then the primary coil, which uh, is not ideal, it has a parasitic, uh, consumes some power, so you have some dissipation there. Uh, part of the power is dissipated in the tissue because electromagnetic wave uh, is absorbed by water and uh, more than 90% of the tissue is made up of water and water can absorb electromagnetic field. The higher the frequency of the carrier, the, the higher that uh, absorption, that's the mechanism you use in your microwave oven in, in the kitchen. But 
you tend to use much lower um, uh, carriers in order to minimize the loss in the tissue. And the secondary coil, again, it has parasitic resistance. It has uh, power dissipation as a result. And then you have to convert this AC energy, this AC signal, back to DC and regulate it because uh, the electronics tend to require a stable DC supply. They cannot be powered directly by an AC signal. So this conversion from AC back to DC also has its own losses. So if you basically uh, consider the efficiency of every one of these uh, steps, the overall efficiency of wireless power transfer from the source to the destination is multipl multiplication of the efficiencies of every one of these steps. Now, then you have a number that is the multiplication of <clears throat> all of these other numbers and efficiency is basically maximum 100% and 100% basically it's one. That's perfect uh, power uh, transfer when you have no losses, but Every one of these numbers is less than one, and when you multiply them together, which one has the strongest effect on your overall efficiency? So I probably you you cannot maybe you can repeat the answer uh, for yourself, but the the step that has the smallest efficiency is the one that dominates the overall efficiency. So your Overall power transfer efficiency is dominated by the weakest link in this chain of uh, sequences that the power goes through. And let me tell you which one is the weakest. The wireless power transfer from primary coil to the secondary coil is, the, it, it, it tends to be the smallest efficiency among all of these other ones. And that is why when we want to improve the overall power efficiency, we tend to focus on the weakest of uh, these uh, basically chain of uh, power uh, delivery. And that's basically where we, most of the research and the rest of this presentation is uh, focusing on. Uh, so this is basically what I just showed in a top level uh, block diagram. This is a very simplified circuit level presentation of what I just told you about. So you have your energy source on the left side of the screen. Then there is a power conversion from DC to AC. Then your signal passes through an inductive link. Then you have uh, some matching and adaptation uh, in between. And finally, you have conversion from AC back to DC, regulating the DC and finally covering your, uh, uh, your device. Uh, today, I will only talk about the inductive link, which is the most important and the weakest chain of events in this whole wireless power transfer. But we uh, have uh, many uh, publications, uh, both uh, in basically, uh, uh, by, by myself and uh, by uh, a lot of other uh, researchers and engineers uh, that have covered uh, all these uh, other uh, stages. And if you are interested, uh, you can uh, look at uh, some of the differences that I will uh, present uh, throughout the rest of this uh, presentation. Um, so moving uh, forward, and uh, I uh, see that uh, uh, there are uh, uh, some uh, chats and uh, Q&A. I, I guess, uh, uh, Dr. Raj, uh, do we keep the Q&A uh, at the end of the presentation? At the end is good, yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, so uh, I will uh, basically, um, uh, all of these, uh, and, and please do post your uh, questions. Uh, I will make sure we leave uh, enough time uh, for uh, Q&A uh, at the end, uh, just to uh, try to cover as much of this presentation as I can. Uh, I leave all of them um, for the end of the uh, presentation. So let's uh, jump in and uh, go deep into the design and optimization of the inductive link. Now that you know how important is uh, this particular block in the entire chain of uh, wireless power uh, transmission. Um, 
So if I can move forward. And uh, one, one thing I want to uh, show in this uh, slide is that uh, really inductive uh, wireless power transmission uh, is uh, nothing new. Uh, as a matter of fact, it goes back uh, all the way uh, like 190 years ago. I was thinking about this and uh, like really appreciating uh, how <laughs> old is these uh, concepts and uh, uh, physics uh, behind it when uh, Michael uh, Faraday uh, discovered that if you uh, change a, a magnetic uh, field, if you create and change a magnetic field uh, in, a, in a basically in a space, and that is in that space you have a closed loop of a conductor. So you can see in this uh, lower uh, right side image that I have uh, borrowed uh, from Wikipedia. Uh, so you are generating a time varying magnetic field and you tend to have in that space nearby because that magnetic field uh, basically uh, diminishes very rapidly. So that uh, uh, other closed loop should be uh, nearby, uh, you will, these changes in the magnetic field that pass through this uh, loop, this conductive loop, will uh, basically create an, a, an electromotive force. And this electromotive force will apply force to the movable charges in this conductive loop, in this uh, wire. And as a result, you induce current. So this is really the basis of not only wireless power transfer, actually this is the basis of inductors because this magnetic field also passes through the coil that is generating the magnetic field as well. And that is what uh, causes the induction. So even if there was no secondary loop, just this magnetic field that would pass through this loop of wire and creates the, basically this additional electromotive force re realizes this uh, characteristic of inductance that you have in every inductor that is one of the three uh, major passive elements in every circuit, capacitance, resistance, and inductance. So every electrical engineer in, in the electrical engineering circuit 101 uh, becomes familiar with these three. So this is the fundamental basis of uh, how an inductor works. And you have transformers and you have electric motors and electric generators. And the last but not the least is wireless power transfer. So this is not a new concept by any means. It goes back 190 years. Uh, now, <clears throat> there are many models <clears throat> that you can use in order to estimate uh, the inductance of a single loop or a solenoid, basically a combination of several loops of wire in series or in, in parallel. Uh, and uh, here I'm, I'm, there are many, many models. Uh, and here I'm uh, basically uh, showing uh, uh, a couple of them from this uh, reference. Let's focus on uh, the, uh, the, the two inductors. So when you have two inductors that are nearby, uh, one of them is used as a transmitter. The other one is used as a receiver of power. And what is important here, and this is where the geometry and the relative positioning of these two inductors becomes very important. Why? Because the wireless power transfer, according to the Faraday uh, law, happens by that portion of the flux that is generated by the transmitter that passes through the receiver coil. So as if, if you are designing an inductive link, your most important factor in creating an efficient and improving that eta of uh, coil one or transmitter to receiver is to maximize the flux, that portion of flux that is generated by the primary inductor that is passing through a secondary inductor. So we call that mutual inductance. Um, and if you divide the mutual inductance M12 by the square root of the self inductance of these two coils, you end up with a factor, basically with a number <clears throat> that is called coupling coefficient. So you will see this 
factor k over and over again in the equations that I will show you. So here it's very important to understand the physical concept behind the coupling coefficient that is mutual inductance is the flux linkage between the transmitter and receiver coil divided or basically normalized by the values of the primary coil inductance, self-inductance, and the secondary coil self-inductance. Moving forward, uh, you can do wireless power transfer just by two inductors. And as I said, I'm, I'm basically pointing to uh, this simple circuit on the lower right side. Every inductor, as I mentioned to you, has parasitic resistance. So you connect a source, you connect a function generator, an AC, or that is basically your battery followed by a class E power amplifier that converts AC, uh, DC to AC, and then pass that AC signal through the primary inductor or L1, and the flux basically will generate, according to the Faraday law, voltage V2 across L2. L2 has its own parasitic resistance, which is R2, and eventually the power or that voltage, part of that voltage will be will appear across RL. RL is the electronics, is basically the target. So the power that eventually receives at RL, that's the good power. All the power that you dissipate in R1 and R2, basically they, they turn into heat. So those are the wasted power. So my goal as the, 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 the designer of this uh, inductive wireless power transfer link is to maximize the power that is delivered to this load RL and minimize the power that is dissipated in R1 and R2 and here also RS. That's really the fundamental circuit basic of um, what we want to do in wireless power transfer. And as I said, the relative geometry the size of these coils and how they are located with respect to one another and their distance make all the difference in this very important factor uh, of M or uh, K, depending on, uh, actually uh, K is much uh, easier to use than M because uh, it is normalized and therefore you can compare apples with apples when you talk in terms of K as opposed to in terms of M because it's, it's normalized depending based on the size of these inductors. Now, another very important discovery early on was that if you resonate the, these inductors by adding capacitors both to the primary loop and the secondary loop, what something very interesting happens. So you can see the on the lower right, the dashed line is how much voltage you get on the receiver side, VL, if you don't use any capacitor. You can see that you get a certain amount of voltage. And remember, the vertical axis is logarithmic. But if you use these two capacitors, CP and uh, uh, this is CP, which is parallel uh, with CL and C1, uh, and choose the value of these capacitors so that they resonate at the same uh, frequency as your carrier. So if your carrier basically uh, is at a certain frequency, if you resonate these two, the voltage that appears at the receiver increases by almost one order of magnitude. That, that's the continuous black line that you can see is at, at a frequency of interest here tends to be 10 megahertz is much, much higher than the dashed line at that frequency. So I can uh, tell you with a, a strong degree of certainty that every wireless link, every uh, electrical engineer or biomedical engineer basically uses uh, this very basic concept of resonance in designing a uh, wireless power uh, transfer link because simply you get one order of magnitude improvement in uh, wireless power transfer. Under certain circumstances, you might even deviate from the, the carrier frequency by adjusting the size of these capacitors, but this is really very basic and fundamental. Now, let's go and look at uh, the, the value of the power that you deliver uh, to the load and uh, see if we can calculate the efficiency, because again, we want to compare apples with apples and we want to maximize 
efficiency. And that is basically that portion of the power that comes out of Vs that eventually uh, arrives at Rl. That's what we want to maximize. And uh, here, let me combine Cl and Cp and call it C2 for the sake of simplicity. So C2 is resonating with L2 and C1 is resonating with L1. And both of them are at the same carrier frequency as uh, the source uh, Vs. Now, uh, one more further simplification for our uh, circuit uh, analysis purposes, I want to convert this uh, series resistance R2 to a parallel resistance. And that can be easily done. You can theoretically prove that if you connect this uh, resistor RP2, and if its value is a Q2, basically quality factor of the secondary coil squared times that R2 in series, that will be the value of this parallel uh, resistor and the effect on the circuit is exactly the same as that series resistor. So whether I use that series resistor or this parallel RP2, these two circuits are exactly the same. And the reason I want to use RP2 is that I want to simplify this circuit by combining RP2 uh, with uh, my RL. Uh, and then on the, on the receiver side, I have a parallel RLC. Uh, so I have L, L2, a parallel combination of RP2 and RL and C2. Now, I want to emphasize one more thing. First of all, uh, I, I think all of you are familiar with the definition of quality factor in coils. So the quality factor is omega. So it basically is proportional to the frequency of operation. Omega is 2 pi F, uh, F0 that is generated by the source. Uh, divided by the uh, times uh, inductance, divided by the resistance. So when I compare two coils, one of them has a quality factor of 100 and the other one is has a quality factor of, let's say, uh, 200. Uh, the one, if, if I'm using both of them to, for operating at a certain frequency, the one that has higher inductance and lower Parasitic resistance will give me higher quality factor. And this is where optimization of each individual coil becomes important because, as you will see later, the higher the quality factor, the better the efficiency of wireless power transfer. But, and in fact, some of these coils are basically miniaturized and uh, placed on a coil, on, on, a, on a cheap or on a flexible surface, and as I will show later. In fact, Professor Raj himself is an expert in developing uh, such, uh, such MEMS uh, devices. And uh, then uh, the, the thickness of this uh, inductor is of, of this conductor layer, the width of this conductor layer. The, the, the distance between the turns of this uh, coil, all of these parameters become important in determining the quality factor of your coil. If you are making this coil out of wires, like the one that I showed <coughs> uh, here, um, let me show you the, uh, this uh, neural link coil or uh, here, many of these coils, uh, some of these coils are micro machine, so lithographically defined on a flexible circuit. Some of these coils are actually made of uh, thin uh, insulated wires. So picking the diameter of the wire and the, the thickness of the insulation and the number of turns and the distance between the turns, these are all very, very important in terms of determining the value of the quality factor of the coil. So what I'm trying to say here is that when I say we use a coil and maximize the quality factor, there is a lot of optimization and detail in just maximizing the quality factor of the coil. And as you can see, it's also dependent on the self-inductance and the operating frequency. So choosing the operating frequency of your inductive link also affects the quality factor of the coil and becomes very, very important. So continuing along this uh, path of uh, finding the efficiency of wireless power transfer, now I have a simplified circuit 
uh, on the secondary side after these conversions, now using these two equations, RF and CREF, I can reflect every element in the secondary side of this inductive beam onto the primary side. So in, in circuits, when you have a transformer, when you have a when you have two coils with mutual coupling M, if you use these two equations, you can move the components from one side of the transformer onto the other side. So now I bring everything to the primary side by moving basically the, the capacitance and resistance which are in parallel on the secondary side onto the primary side and call them C reflected and R reflected. And then the secondary coil itself can also be reflected onto the primary and replaced by K12 squared L, L2. And that is where the, again, you can see over and over the importance of that uh, parameter called uh, coupling coefficient. So you will see in these equations. Now, let's uh, think about another concept. I have a, in this uh, primary equivalent circuit of this uh, 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 circuit on top, I have a series inductor uh, and the capacitor, a series LC, and I have a parallel LC. Now, back to your circuit 101, a series LC, if you are ideal, can be shown to be a short at resonance frequency. So if you are looking at this circuit, only at the resonance frequency omega zero, C1 and L1 short all together, and then a parallel L and C, if you are only looking at them at the resonance frequency, becomes an open circuit. So what is beautiful about this analysis is that you don't need to even worry about and then your circuit becomes as simple as R1 and the reflected resistance at resonance frequency. And R1 is the parasitic resistance of L1 and reflected R is a combination of RP2 and RL. So let's go back to the question of which power is good power, which power or which part of the power dissipation is bad power, the ones that is turning into heat. The power dissipated in R1 turns into heat the power dissipated in RP2 turns into heat. The power dissipated in R turns into heat, but that's the good power. That's the power that we want to power our electronics. And therefore, what I want is to maximize the power that is being delivered to our ref, and then maximize between these two the power that is delivered to our L. So just uh, to, to put that uh, into uh, the mathematical equations, I have the voltage division between R1 and Rf, and then I have the, basically if you then focus on Rf, I have the current division between Rp2 and Rl. So finally, at the end of the day, my efficiency from Vs to Rl is the multiplication of the first resistive division and the second uh, current division. So the voltage divider in the primary and the current divider in the secondary. And this is, and, and if I replace every one of these resistors with their equivalent uh, value in terms of the quality factor, you will end up with this very important equation that explains the uh, efficiency of a, an inductive link a simple uh, fashion, uh, basically. Now, what is in, important in this equation is this factor, K squared Q1, Q2. And Q2L is actually Q2 that is loaded by uh, the, the inductance. So I have put all these equations uh, in, in, the, in the slides uh, so that uh, you, you see the, the, the relationship. But this factor is very, very important because you can see in this equation that if K squared Q1, Q2 is very large, is if it, if it goes towards infinity, then my power transfer efficiency is getting close to 100%, but that's impossible. And if K squared Q1, Q2 is going towards zero, then your power, you, you basically you are not transferring 
any cover. So the take home message from what I just described to you in this slide is that your goal as the designer of this inductive link is to maximize K squared Q1, Q2. So the co you, you try to maximize the quality factor of uh, the primary coin, the secondary coin, and also the coupling coefficient between these two points. Of course, things I, I have really simplified it down to something easily understandable in a short uh, presentation. There is a lot more uh, detail uh, to this. So let's talk about some of that uh, detail now. Uh, so um, basically, uh, oh, there is, there is also, you, you may ask, okay, the, the, the efficiency is the received power divided by the transmitted power, but how much power finally delivered to the load? So, for example, if my electronic electronics, the, my, my power budget is 10 milliwatt, the efficiency by itself does not help you very much because it's just the ratio between uh, the power received and the power transmitted. You want to know what is the, how you, sh you should select these other parts of the circuit in order to uh, basically deliver enough power uh, to the load, and that can be calculated from uh, this uh, equation, uh, the, the power or PDL or power delivered uh, to the load. Uh, and here I'm, I'm basically uh, summarizing uh, everything uh, I just uh, explained to you. And then comes the question of how to maximize this. And uh, in order to maximize, of course, you differentiate. For example, you want to maximize with respect to the quality factor of the primary and secondary coils, and you differentiate the PDE and PDL with respect to any one of these parameters that you are interested in. And then if you solve the equation, you find that condition that would maximize the PD and PDL. So this way you can differentiate with respect to every one of these important parameters in the equation and find the best value for uh, those uh, parameters. Now, one more important thing is the value of the RL itself. So the value of RL is sometimes not constant. For example, in the case of a cochlear implant, if you are hearing a loud noise, the stimulation has to be more frequent and also at higher amplitude. That means more power consumption. More co power consumption means a smaller RL. If you are in a quiet room, the number of stimulations is much less and the amplitude of the stimulation is much lower. That means lower power consumption or larger RL. Now, if I if you look at the power transfer efficiency in a two coil link, you see that it's a strongly, the power transfer efficiency is a strongly dependent on the value of RL, just because of the equations that I showed you. And these are some, uh, this is an example of a, an inductive link that we actually constructed to prove uh, this uh, phenomenon. You see that at 200 ohms, I get more than 70% power transfer efficiency. But then at 10 ohm, my power transfer efficiency is uh, getting close to only 20%. And then the same way going the other way. So in a dynamic environment, in a cochlear implant that I, I sometimes the user is in a quiet room, sometimes the user is listening to uh, like a rock, rock band uh, music and the, 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 the inductive uh, basically, RL continuously changes or a retinal implant. Sometimes you are in a bright room, sometimes you are basically in a dark room, and therefore RL changes. How can we <clears throat> maintain basically a high level of efficiency everywhere? And the answer <clears throat> actually, there are several ways to address this problem, uh, but you use a matching circuit. Uh, and uh, there are basically you, there are there are three ways to address this problem. You use a matching circuit. You can use multiple coils, or you can use adaptive circuits on the receiver side or on the transmitter side. And my focus is on the use of multiple uh, coils. And the reason that uh, we use uh, multiple coils is that uh, first of all, we are later. <coughs> if I uh, can uh, more quickly uh, go and uh, cover the 
uh, last part of this uh, presentation, uh, uh, we, we want to work on uh, implants that are very, very small. And therefore, uh, we want to um, basically integrate everything ideally on one single chip. And therefore, uh, using passive components that tend to be large and cannot be integrated on chip for this matching circuit is not uh, really uh, desirable. And adaptive circuit is something that actually we have used uh, and, and uh, it's uh, uh, like, I, I have put that uh, outside the scope of uh, this uh, presentation, but want to very quickly show you this concept of using uh, multiple uh, coils. Uh, and uh, actually, I, I, looking at the time, I should uh, uh, skip uh, some of the details, uh, but very quickly, uh, there are different topologies you can use uh, to, to create basically uh, optimal matching between your inductive link and the source as well as uh, the load. Uh, the details of it uh, you can find in uh, references as well as uh, a book that I will uh, uh, present uh, at, 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 the, at the very end. Um, and your inductive link can also have uh, basically four different topologies, uh, depending on which topology give you the best matching both at the source and uh, at, at the load. You can select uh, your uh, inductive link to be series, 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 parallel series, series parallel, or parallel, parallel. The one that I actually went into detail and analyzed uh, for you was, happened to be the series parallel. It's the easiest one to analyze, but you can actually use any other one of these as well, depending on your source and load uh, conditions. Um, so speaking of using additional coils uh, in order to create good matching, uh, I don't go through the equations in the interest of time, but all the equations are derived uh, in, in our uh, earlier publications, as well as the book uh, that I will uh, introduce uh, at, at, the, at the very end. But if you happen to introduce a third coil on the receiver side, the equations become more complex, uh, but the fundamentals are still the same. And what I want to point out in this equation is to basically show you the importance of that K squared Q2. So here I have changed the numbering of the coils, but you see that that part is being repeated over and over again. What it tells you is that regardless of how uh, complex this equation gets when we uh, analyze this circuit, that fundamental concept of maximizing K squared Q2, Q3, the, 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 the coils that are across the, the tissue, that doesn't go away. So that is the common, uh, actually here, the common numerator uh, among uh, all of these uh, equations. And therefore, uh, in optimizing the geometry of these coils, we always try to maximize K squared Q2, Q3, regardless of whether you use four coils, three coils, or two coils. Uh, that's really the take home message for your optimization. Now, the beauty of three coil versus two coil is that now by adjusting the coupling coefficient between L3 and L4 between this additional inductor that I have added on the receiver side, you can see that I can get, I mean, this is like really like magic. I can get flat 70% efficiency compared to the two coil. The two coil is the, uh, is the dotted line that it was only optimal at one particular RL. Now by changing the mutual inductance, I can get optimal efficiency from RL of 10 ohm to one kilo. This is very, very beautiful and very practical because as I told you, in real life, RL is variable. It's not always constant. So uh, basically this will allow you to adjust where you want the RL uh, to be or, or, or even dynamically change it if you use adaptive circuits. Um, in the interest of time, I don't go into the detail, but here I'm showing you in this 3D uh, graph, the power transfer efficiency is the Z axis, and then X and Y are the distance between L2 and L3, basically the thickness of the tissue between your uh, the, the, the primary coil, the, the, the transmitter coil, and the 
the resonator that you have added uh, as as the third inductor, um, and uh, the 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 y-axis is K34 or that variable, the one that actually you adjust as in order to maximize the power transfer efficiency. And you can see that this is the area, a graph like this, the red area, the dark red area is where your power transfer efficiency is optimized. So if you sweep these parameters in, in MATLAB, uh, uh, then you can basically find, uh, or any software that you use, you can optimize and find uh, the, the, the region that uh, a combination of the distance, your nominal distance, and uh, the coupling coefficient that you design by the sizing of your coil give you the best power transfer efficiency. And as I told you, it's not only you should look at the power transfer efficiency, you should also look at the power delivered to the load. And that happens to be maximized at other regions of uh, 23 and uh, K34. What I want to point out is that since both of these parameters are important to you, in a three coil combination, you have regions that are both PDL and PTE or dark red. That's a good thing. That's, that's telling you that in your optimization, you can satisfy both high power tra transfer efficiency and high power delivered to the load at the same time by, by properly selecting your uh, parameters. That is achievable in a three uh, coil uh, scenario. And the last uh, uh, scenario that I want to uh, show you in this uh, short uh, presentation is the four coil uh, inductive ring. And this actually uh, in, in 2007, a group at uh, a group of physicists at MIT uh, create a lot of uh, buzz. Uh, they were all over the news by showing that across a room, like basically eight meters uh, or uh, two or three meters away uh, between the transmitter and receiver, they could turn on a light bulb uh, by, by transferring power basically across this uh, distance. And that was really amazing. Uh, so the, as you can see, they have used huge coils with a very, very high uh, quality factor. But the same idea and the same four coil concept can be utilized for uh, our, um, uh, for our uh, purpose. So once again, I show you just the, uh, the circuit diagram. Now I have a resonator added on the transmitter side in addition to the resonator on the uh, receiver side. And the equation becomes even more complicated. But that K squared Q1, Q2, and K squared Q2, Q3 is still here. So once again, I emphasize that that is your uh, objective. Now, if I show you the 3D, uh, the similar 3D diagram of the four coiling, there is a disadvantage to four coiling because what it what it's showing you is that the areas where PTE is the best, they happen not to overlap the areas that the PDL is the best. What is? I found we need to wrap up so students can ask questions. Uh, okay. Okay. Sure. Sure. I. I, I, I think Definitely. Uh, so, so just uh, uh, want to basically compare this with the three coil link uh, where you have optimal PDL and uh, PTE. And you can see that there is a big advantage to three coil link over four coil link if both of these are important to you. So just uh, again, uh, I, I probably should skip the, the small uh, uh, implant uh, uh, discussion. Uh, but uh, this actually, I think this this is a, a nice uh, conclusion of uh, this uh, presentation. A comparison between uh, two coil link, three coil link, and four coil link um, uh, uh, designs and inductive links. And here you can see with these uh, smiley faces, where depending on the condition, when you have a strong coupling or when uh, you want a large power delivered to the load or a small power delivered to the load or when you have a very strong constraint on the size, which one of these topologies and choices are the best in order to achieve 
uh, optimal wireless power transfer between your transmitter and uh, receiver. So let's uh, basically uh, stop uh, at this uh, uh, nice conclusion of uh, the, the discussion be, uh, up until uh, this point and uh, answer uh, some of the questions. Yeah, we have quite a few questions and they are pretty loaded uh, electrical circuit questions. So we have it in the Q&A that you can see them. Okay, uh, uh, are you, sh should I like uh, go uh, through them one by one or are you moderating? Uh, so you can go through them one by one, so I don't have to read them out. You can maybe explain the question and also answer them. Okay, so, so uh, uh, a small uh, announcement. Uh, so the next okay. meeting is actually my meeting with our team, packaging team and the biomedical device design student team. So if they can stay here, then we can continue this discussion till as long as it takes. And then later on, we can move to the one-on-one -on -one discussion. So the next meeting anyway is a seamless uh, continuation of this. So people can just stay here who are invited for the next meeting. Thank you. Yeah, we can continue. Okay, so I have uh, both the chat and the uh, Q&A. So maybe we should go through the Q&A first, right? Yes, Q&A please. Okay, so um, let's uh, start from the top. Uh, would you please discuss about uh, self-powered uh, electronics uh, in the future, uh, your opinion? Um, is it possible to use it uh, instead of the ability? Okay, very, very, uh, that, that's an excellent uh, question. So if I understand uh, correctly, uh, and uh, basically based on uh, what I have read in the research, uh, uh, it's, uh, and, and I, I, I assume that uh, the, 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 the questioner is uh, asking this uh, with respect to implantable devices. So there is ongoing research to, for example, uh, derive uh, power out of, uh, for example, glucose uh, in, in the body, because uh, like in the body, there are different chemicals uh, and uh, you can actually create uh, batteries uh, out of uh, these chemicals or uh, even uh, some sort of, I, I'm not an expert in those areas and the ch those chemistries, or create something like a fuel cell to actually generate uh, power internally inside uh, the, the body. So my answer to this question is that uh, number one, uh, what is very important is the safety of these devices. Mm -hmm. to, to give you basically a very interesting example of this is that there is a company in uh, California, uh, I think it's called, uh, uh, they, they have this concept of uh, digital health and uh, they, they, they have a, 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 a pill that you can uh, swallow and this pill is actually covered with a layer that when, it, when that cover uh, is mixed with the stomach uh, acid, it actually becomes like a battery and generates power to send data that is stored in that, there is a tiny chip with that pill that can send information out to a patch attached to your belly. So it's a very, very smart and interesting idea, but what I want to say is that that, chemis that chemistry basically goes away in, I don't know exactly for how long, but in a few minutes, when that, uh, uh, in, uh, the, the data in the pill is uh, transferred to the patch that is attached to your belly, then uh, it, it basically that, that chemistry is gone and that, that, that power is no longer available and the, the chip basically passes through the GI tract and gets uh, out of the body. And therefore, um, uh, that is basically not good enough for a cochlear implant. There are researchers that are working on um, uh, basically longer term uh, self-powered electronics, uh, but uh, the, the, the amount of power that as far as I know they can generate is in microwatt uh, level. And that is enough for certain applications, but not sufficient for a cochlear implant or retinal implant yet. Uh, let's go to the next question. Uh, in a three-coil system, misalignment becomes more uh, critical in implants. How can you approach this problem? Um, actually, misalignment is uh, important in all of those uh, three uh, different scenarios that I uh, mentioned to you. But what I want to uh, tell you is that when you use actually these additional coils, in fact, you are basically making the whole system more flexible. So relatively speaking, 
In fact, a four coil link is more flexible in terms of misalignment compared to three coil, and three coil link is more flexible compared to uh, two coil link. And as a result, I think you are benefiting uh, by using these additional resonators. The cost that you pay, which, which was in my last uh, summary slide, is the size. So, of course, adding one more coil, which is not on cheap, is going to in increase the size of your implant, and that's the price that you pay. Next question, um, in multiple coils, uh, while they are in the tissue environment, uh, two coils in the tissue environment have high mutual coupling. Is it also pertaining to uh, EM waves that uh, propagation, propagates in linear fashion, not yet then due to Electric property of the tissue. Okay. If I if I understand the uh, question um, uh, correctly, the question is uh, whether the, the tissue is uh, affecting the propagation of uh, the magnetic field. That's an excellent question, and uh, my answer to this question is that it all depends on the frequency of operation. So if your electromagnetic field is at high frequency it's being basically absorbed by the tissue. So actually it doesn't even penetrate deep enough into the tissue. If for example, you use one gigahertz or two gigahertz or even 2.4 gigahertz, which is the peak of the absorption of the cover, we are not even talking about the shape of the electromagnetic field around the antenna because it doesn't even uh, go deep and reaches your implant. However, the advantage of low frequency, if we use, for example, 20 megahertz somewhere between uh, like uh, 10 megahertz to 100 megahertz, then the tissue absorption is very small. The tissue is almost transparent to magnetic field, and therefore it doesn't kind of interfere with the magnetic field. So your magnetic field is like the way, the, almost the same way it propagates through the air or, or a free space. It, it, uh, Propagates through the tissue and reaches your uh, implantable uh, device. Uh, and next question: Since high frequency electromagnetic field generates heat in the tissue, that's true. Uh, what is the maximum uh, usual frequency of operation? Oh, excellent! So I was actually answering this question. Uh, it is unfortunate that uh, I ran out of time. Maybe that's a topic of another. Uh, presentation to talk about a small uh, implantable <coughs> devices. So the frequency of choice, the optimum, uh, first of all, that omega zero that you saw in the equation shows the importance of the choice of the frequency. So it's not only important because a high frequency is absorbed in the tissue, but it also affects your power transfer efficiency and the uh, geometry and the design of your coils. So the optimal uh, frequency, as I mentioned, is somewhere between, uh, you can even go lower, uh, uh, you can, I have seen implant design around five megahertz up to 100 megahertz. But 100 megahertz and 200 megahertz are for tiny, because in electronics, the higher the frequency, the smaller the size of your passive components and the smaller the size of these devices. So the, the smaller the implant, the optimal frequency is higher. The larger the implant, you tend to move to uh, lower uh, frequencies and therefore, uh, the answer is that as long as you are not reaching like gigahertz level, the, the, the optimal frequency depends on the size of your implant. However, you should also take into account the standards. Uh, basically, there are uh, the, the electromagnetic fields and the radio waves are strictly regulated because you don't want to have interference with the police uh, uh, communications or other uh, electronic devices. And therefore, you have to look at the regulations for your device as well. Can we use the DC transmission inside the body for minimization of losses to the tissue? Okay, so uh, actually DC is very dangerous inside the body. Uh, again, I think in uh, biomedical engineering 101, uh, you learn that uh, if your voltage, there is this uh, 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 specific voltage called water window. So depending on what type of metal you have, exposed uh, uh, to the tissue because you, you, you tend to have electrodes, uh, you, you, your DC voltage <clears throat> should not go 
beyond the water window over a, a long period of time, because then you are starting to electrolyze water and create nasty chemicals and change the pH of the tissue. Uh, and that, that's very dangerous. So uh, power transfer is being researched through a capacitor, but still you use AC signal. So DC inside the body is a no-no. So hear it from me, maybe for a small, very small, people are using basically very small amount of DC to pass current uh, to the brain and all that. This is uh, ongoing research, but in exposure to tissue, like above half a volt, I would say is a no-no, is a total no-no. Never use DC inside the body. <laughs> Uh, so, do you have any uh, data on the losses uh, seen uh, through the tissue, for example, uh, fat versus muscle? Uh, actually, one of my uh, slides, uh, I have uh, that uh, information, but uh, unfortunately, there was uh, not enough time uh, to uh, go through the, that part. Uh, uh, but I can, uh, if you uh, send me uh, email or uh, maybe find me, uh, on uh, LinkedIn, uh, I can uh, I can certainly send you uh, more information on that. Uh, you mentioned that uh, it's uh, desired, uh, and, and I, I mean numerical specific numerical values. Uh, you mentioned that uh, it's desired to put uh, everything uh, on a single chip. Uh, is it possible for RF frequency on uh, CMOS, uh, what is the uh, bottleneck? Oh yeah, I mean the RF on CMOS uh, is basically your, your, your cell phone uh, has uh, tens of uh, chips. Uh, actually now they tend to integrate all of them on one major uh, chip, but uh, RF on, uh, in, on CMOS is one of the most uh, important uh, topics in uh, IC design uh, companies like Qualcomm, Broadcom, uh, Apple, uh, they are heavily involved in uh, basically implementing RF transmitters and receivers on chip. But of course, yes, implantable devices, that portion of uh, the RF uh, that uh, can be placed on chip uh, is integrated because the size is very important. So we put everything, including RF, on the same chip. And uh, that is basically um, uh, why we are not interested in passive components that are too large that cannot be integrated <coughs> on the same chip, if I understand the question correctly. Uh, what is the maximum uh, distance that uh, such system can transfer power with significant efficiency over 50%? Okay, so it, it very much depends on the geometry of your coin. So uh, basically, if you use, uh, people are working on uh, magnetoelectric and uh, ultrasound and other, other mechanism for uh, delivering power inside the body. But if you are basically only talking about uh, inductive and near field wireless power transfer, which was the focus of uh, my presentation, everything depends on the size of the coil and the size of the implant. So the size of the implant, depending on the location that you want to implant, is really not up to the designer. So you want the implant ideally to be nothing. So basically the answer on, on the receiver side is as small as possible, but from the coil design is as large as possible that the, the space that you have would allow. And then once you decide the size of the implant, which is basically you, you choose the code to be as large as possible, then you look at the distance and then design the transmitter point according to the size of the uh, receiver. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, besides your explanation about wireless support uh, pacemakers, uh, it is, uh, is it reasonable to use WPT for a leadless pacemaker that needs to be smaller? As a matter of fact, I want to say that I said the opposite. Pacemakers are not wirelessly powered. So pacemakers have low enough power consumption to have a primary battery. So they have a battery that is not rechargeable. And for a pacemaker, that is very important because if your pacemaker stops working, that could mean death to the patient. So Basically, for a cochlear implant, if as a result of misalignment, or for example, if the coil falls off, 
it basically the, the, the user does not hear for a while. It's not a life threatening condition. But for your pacemaker, if the coil, there is a coil misalignment and the, the, the transmitter basically falls off and doesn't deliver power and your pacemaker is not, uh, doesn't have onboard power to continue operating, that could mean sudden death. So as far as I know, there is no FDA approved there is ongoing research in wirelessly powered pacemakers, but wireless power is not being used neither uh, for basically these uh, smaller pacemakers nor the uh, traditional pacemakers. Uh, maybe there is ongoing research to have a combination of onboard uh, re rechargeable battery, but uh, they they actually they are they're like because this, they are they are safety critical. Uh, you should be very, very careful with uh, uh, basically when this pacemaker may stop working during that 10 year period of operation. So I don't think uh, wireless power transfer is advisable for uh, pacemakers. Uh, could you please also comment on the safety limit of using uh, EM magnetic uh, field in a human? Okay, so again, uh, I, I, I didn't get a chance to cover uh, parts of this uh, presentation. Uh, but to give you, I mean, that, that's like one whole uh, course or, or presentation by itself, the electromagnetic uh, safety uh, in, in wireless implantable uh, devices. So there are well-defined certain limits that uh, considering the frequency of operation and how much of this power is absorbed in the tissue, uh, those basically that will be the limiting factor for your implantable device. The rule of thumb is that as a result of using this implantable device, the temperature at the tissue should not increase by more than one degree C over a long period of time. <clears throat> so in order to tell basically whether you are dissipating too much power or not, think about this rule of thumb. No more increase of the local temperature of the tissue by only one degree C. So that tell you how sensitive the tissue is with increased Temperature, so you should be very careful with respect to that. Uh, does electromagnetic uh, shielding <clears throat> uh, practical solution for biomedical implants uh, to increase coupling factor due to restrictions of body and uh, impatient? Okay, so uh, yes, uh, the, basically when, when you say shielding, uh, I also uh, kind of expand it to using uh, coils, for example, with a magnetic core? And the answer is yes. In fact, in order to improve that factor K, the coupling coefficient between uh, the, the receiver and transmitter, uh, 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 basically uh, shielding and um, uh, ferrites and, and cores are being used uh, for these uh, implantable devices. Uh, there is a one caveat, uh, uh, actually there are two. Number one, that will increase the size and the, the, the volume of your uh, implantable device, but sometimes in order to get sufficient K, that's the price you pay, that's number one. And number two, when it comes to implantable devices, you should always think about MRI compatibility, because always remember, your patient at any time might require to undergo an MRI scanning, and inside the MRI machine, there are very, very strong magnetic fields. They tend to be DC magnetic field. The AC magnetic field is weaker than the AC magnetic field. However, your implant, in order to be FDA approved, has to be MRI compatible in order not to generate heat. So when you use those cores and those shielding, I would tell you that the most important question that FDA will ask you is that, is this MRI compatible or not? And you have to show sufficient proof and documentation and measurement that your implant and shielding is safe with respect to MRI imaging. Um, I have read article about uh, RF uh, ultrasound relay for covering deep, deep implants like uh, retina. Do you think uh, this kind of WPT is uh, reliable uh, and industrial solution? Do you have a plan to research ultrasound? Okay, so yeah, so uh, ultrasound, I mean, that's a very uh, hot uh, discussion. Uh, even these days, it became uh, very hot uh, uh, a few uh, years ago. Several researchers at UC Berkeley uh, came up with the idea of uh, delivering uh, power through uh, ultrasound and all of a sudden it uh, caught uh, and, and a lot of uh, research and funding was available for this type of 
uh, wireless uh, power transfer. However, I think that has been subsided in recent years a little bit for two reasons. Uh, number one, uh, the, the, the transmitter, like the, the, the receiver can receive uh, power, especially if it's very small, can receive power even better than an inductive link uh, in, in longer distance. There is no question about it. I, I, I totally agree uh, that, uh, with that. However, the transmitter is not nearly as efficient as an inductive transmitter. It's both bulky and it's very strong, very, very high power consuming. So imagine your transmitter has to be operated by battery because you, you do not want to connect or have your patient sit next to a, a wall plug in order to recharge the battery. You want this device to be wearable, the, the external part. So having a large and bulky and high power transmitter, again, is a no-no. It's, it's basically, it's not comfortable and it's not practical and therefore uh, uh, that, that's number one problem. Number two problem is that you are very sensitive to misalignment. So even worse than uh, inductive links and therefore you are not, they, I, 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 I'm not aware of um, a, a very practical solution yet. So what people are doing research on it using an array and all sorts of things. Uh, thanks for the presentation. As uh, we know, some research is going on on uh, implantable uh, magnetoelectric receivers. That's true, consisting of uh, piezoelectric and magneto uh, uh, magnetorestrictive uh, material uh, that can be used. Uh, could you please let us know your opinion? About okay, so this is very new topic uh, as far as I know. I, mean, I have uh, seen a few papers. Uh, coming uh, out of this, and uh, it, it sounds uh, very interesting. Uh, my answer to you is that uh, at, at the moment, uh, to be honest with you, I, I don't know enough about uh, this uh, particular mechanism of uh, wireless power transfer. It sounds promising, uh, but um, I, I'm not 100% sure about it, but uh, it seems that it also requires a magnetic, uh, a DC magnetic field uh, to be present. Uh, so there might be some practical issues, uh, but my answer to this question is that I, I don't know enough about this in order to comment on your very good question, but it sounds promising. Uh, and the last uh, question, uh, what are the biomedical applications in which the use of WPT is justified? Actually, I, I showed it in, in my introduction. Uh, so uh, uh, cochlear implants, uh, they have been around for 50 years now, and they are all uh, using uh, WPT, as, as far as I know. They are FDA approved in 70s, and uh, retinal implants are now being uh, FDA approved, uh, and uh, Elon Musk and several other uh, companies are working on brain-computer interfaces that are rechargeable through uh, wireless uh, power transfer. And, oh, one, one more category that I uh, did not mention in my, um, in my presentation. Uh, there are also uh, artificial hearts uh, that basically mechanical pumping hearts that are wirelessly uh, powered. And uh, I think there are versions of those that are uh, approved uh, by, by regulatory work. And <clears throat> they tend to operate at uh, like 10 watt or so. so they, they have large coils and uh, that that's also another um, application of uh, implantable devices um, so I, I i think this is the very last uh, question uh, because i, I think you are... one question i think was posted earlier oh is that the... As, uh, wireless power closed loop simulation makes sense uh, oh absolutely yeah the, the question is is wireless power closed loop stimulation makes sense uh, for example epilepsy control uh, a primary battery is also necessary or not, uh, especially I'm uh, talking about the freedom of patient in case they need to wear. Yeah, so uh, in fact, this question uh, uh, is, is uh, I, I'm not repeating the question in the interest of time. I hope everybody is uh, seeing it. Uh, so the, basically, uh, the, the, the closed loop uh, wireless uh, simulation is a relatively new topic that is being heavily researched. and. Uh, the questioner is exactly right. Uh, <clears throat> actually, Reza, I, I, I know the, the questioner. Uh, thank you for your good question. So it is being researched 
exactly because those old dumb stimulator that they're always stimulating and it was always on at the same frequency and we are talking about epilepsy and deep brain stimulation which is a special type of stimulation used it's like a pacemaker for the brain and the fda approved versions are uh, similar to a pacemaker uh, have a primary battery but uh, there are companies that actually are coming up with products with rechargeable uh, batteries uh, because uh, they have a much higher power consumption than pacemaker so unlike pacemaker that would be uh, operating over 10 years and then need a replacement a deep brain stimulator operates only two to three years so every two to three years you have to go and replace uh, these uh, this large uh, implant and therefore there is a strong motivation to come up with rechargeable battery for uh, for uh, deep brain uh, stimulators and people are using a closed loop stimulation so that you stimulate only when a stimulation is needed so in, instead of having a dumb always on always high stimulation going on forever during this uh, two year period a smart method of stimulating is that look at, for example, the level of the seizure, whether what, what the user is doing, and then apply the right amount of stimulation in order to uh, basically relieve the uh, patient from those tremors and uh, side basically uh, negative effects of uh, Parkinson disease uh, uh, or epilepsy. Uh, for example, and that significantly reduces the power consumption. So instead of, for example, recharging every day, you can recharge only uh, once a week or once every uh, month or so. I don't, I don't know the exact specifications of those devices, but it, it totally makes sense. And there are actually products that uh, will will uh, soon come come to market. Thank you. I think uh, this is a great. I want to thank all the uh, questioners. Uh, very good, uh, very good uh, interaction. I, I, I really uh, <laughs> like the uh, questions and the wealth of uh, knowledge by our audience. And thank you very much. Thank you, all the audience. Uh, many of you actually were hanging around till the end. And I think this is a very stimulating uh, fundamental discussion on the electronics behind wireless power and its impact on biomedical devices. So, and thank you for dwelling on the fundamentals instead of just showing some product examples that we all know through Wikipedia and all that. So it's good that the, the basics were dealt in detail. And so the next one, any people in the packaging lab and the BME course students are invited for the next meeting till 11. I think you have the link. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.